If you read carefully the fourth chapter of the book of Mark, from which our gospel text comes today, you will see that there are various teachings about the sowing of the seeds. And these teachings appear in all three synoptic gospels. There's an oblique reference in the Gospel of John, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in chapter 13 in Matthew, and then in chapter 4 here we have it in Mark, and in chapter 13 in Luke. You may remember the first of the parables in chapter 4 here in Mark has to do with the farmer going out and he's casting the seed. Remember that, he casts the seed from which we get the English word broadcast. You cast the word, you broadcast the seed. And it falls on various types of ground. And then he goes on to tell this story about the one who sows the seed and goes to sleep and goes away and in the power of creation, the power of God, the seed grows and grows and a harvest comes without him knowing how it happens. And then it goes on to speak about the mustard seed. So these seed stories are very, very common, especially in the synoptic gospels. There is one element about the sowing of seeds which is important to understand. In the agriculture of the time, they sowed the seed first, just cast the seed, and then they plowed the field where the seed had been sown. But nothing could happen, no life could happen, no growth would occur until they had plowed the field, until the earth was broken, until everything was turned upside down, the seed would not bear fruit. We have our own colloquial reference to groundbreaking. When we break ground, it's a sign of something new which is happening. And therefore, the metaphor, which is rather important here when we speak about the seeds and the harvest, is that nothing can happen without the ground being broken. And this is the metaphor for the breaking of ground in our own lives, in sacrifice, in pain and suffering, in reversal in life. The ground is broken. We are turned upside down. And only then does the seed find its power in us, and only then can we look toward a harvest. So let me look at this for a few moments and find some, perhaps, manner in which it refers to our own journey of life. In ancient Greece, they had the festival of Dionysius, now, if you read Greek mythology, Dionysius is a very peculiar person. And he has many dedications. One of them, however, being the god of transformation. And in one of these practices, on the festival of Dionysius, leading playwrights were invited to write some script and present a drama that was tragic. And all the citizenry were obliged to come to the drama. It was a competition. It was meant to be an exercise in the spiritual understanding of life and in building community, believing that when we confront pain, suffering, and tragedy, only then do we begin to understand a deeper meaning in life. And secondly, when we share grief, 
We share tears. We share the difficult times of life. The community grows in bonding. And therefore, it was meant to be a spiritual exercise, but also a civic developing option. In ancient Greece, I thought about that this week. I celebrated 48 years of priesthood this past week, and I sat there. I spent most of the day by myself on Thursday, which was my anniversary. And I looked back over my life at 48 years as a priest, and it came to me that whatever growth, whatever way in which I positioned myself to accept the grace of God happened only when I became conscious of my sins, when I failed, the manner in which I respond to failure, when reversal happened in my life, when sacrifice beyond my expectation appeared, when demands which might have been overbearing became part of my journey. Only then did the grace of God really work in my life. And I look back over the years to reflect on these special moments, not moments of triumph, but moments of humanity, moments of weakness, where the grace of God and the power of Jesus Christ came into focus. That's important for us to keep in mind. Only then does the power of Jesus Christ, only then will the grace of God find a presence in us and yield a harvest. In weakness, the power of Jesus Christ becomes present, not in triumph. Not when we are devout and holy and perfect. I was attracted to T.S. Eliot's little gidding when he says this. He said, we shall not cease from exploration. And after all our exploring, we shall arrive back at the place where we started and know it for the first time. When you come back to your place of origin, having gone through suffering and failure and pain and sin and so, then you will know the place for the first time in a deeper way. You will understand the meaning of your life in a deeper way. And I thought to myself, now that my life is very peaceful, I don't have any enemies, I don't have any ecclesial politics in my life, which I did once, there are no things, I don't climb any mountains anymore. I walk in peace now. And therefore, I discerned that the call of the Spirit is to carry other persons' crosses, to share the tears of other people's struggles, to carry the pains that belong to other people. And God knows in our community here at Holy Family, in the last couple of weeks, we have had an abundance of pain and suffering and grief. To enter into the life of the other person, to share the tears, the pain, the struggle, the mystery which appears in everybody's life at some time. Only then can we find a harvest. St. Paul, in this second letter to Corinth, which is part of our text today, says, walk by faith, not by sight. Interpret your life with the eyes and the understanding of faith, not what you can see with the eyes of the world. As part of my reflection over the years this week, Looking back, I wrote a letter to my parents. 
couldn't be delivered because the US mail doesn't go to heaven. But I wrote a letter to my parents and I thanked them for the humanity, the humanity they gave me. They gave me many gifts, but they also gave me humanity. And out of the humanity, I begin to interpret my own human condition. And out of that comes compassion, forgiveness easily given, some understanding of the struggles of people's lives. Since my parents were not perfect, they were just perfectly marvelous. And somehow I heard a voice coming back to me. I thought for a moment saying, you were not perfect. You were just perfectly marvelous. And with that spirit, on this Father's Day, I dedicate this prayer, this anthem, this song to your fathers, for the humanity they gave you, for the name you carry, for the blessings they shared with you, but also for their weakness. To think in gratitude, to think with blessing, and for my wonderful father, who was perfectly marvelous. The tears have all been shed now. We've said our last goodbye. His soul's been blessed, he's laid to rest, and I feel all alone. He was more than just my father, my teacher, my best friend. And he'll still be heard in the tunes we've shared when I play them on my own. And I never will forget him, for he made me what I am. Though he may be gone, memories linger on. I miss him, the old man. As a boy, he'd take me walking by mountain, field, and stream, and show me things not known to kings secrets between him and me like the colors of a pheasant as she rises in the morn or how to fish or make a wish beside the fairy tree and I never For he made me what I am, though he may be gone, memories linger on. I miss him, the old man. I thought he'd live forever, he looked so big and strong. But the minutes fly and the years roll by for a father and a son. And suddenly when it happened, there was so much left unsaid. No second chance for words of thanks for all the things he'd done. And I never...